Well, good afternoon, good morning, or good evening, depending upon where you are in the world, and welcome to today's DevOps.com webinar. I'm Charlene O'Hanlon, moderator for today's event, and I welcome you. We have a great webinar on tap. I'm always excited about this one. But before we get started, we do have a few housekeeping items we need to go over. First of all, today's event is being recorded. So if you miss any or all of the event, you will have the opportunity to access it later on demand. Following today's webinar, we will be sending out an email that contains a link to access the webinar on demand. And we are taking questions from the audience. So if at any time during today's presentation, you have a question for either of our speakers, please don't wait. Don't hesitate, just use your GoToWebinar control panel and submit your question, and we'll try to get to as many as we can near the end of today's webinar. Also, at the end of today's webinar, we will be doing a drawing for four $100 Amazon gift cards. So please stick around. Hopefully, you'll be one of our four lucky winners. All right, with that, let's go ahead and get to today's webinar, which is Secure Data Sharing in OpenShift Environments. Our speakers today are Tim Riley, who is Chief Executive Officer at Zetaset, and Maxim Yankovsky. I'm sorry, Maxim, I always mess up your last name. I apologize for that. Yankovsky. Not a problem. It never <laughs> happened before. This is the first time it never happened before. <laughs> oh, well, at least not today. So, <laughs> but he's the VP of Engineering at Zetaset. Gentlemen, thank you both so much for joining me today. Really do appreciate it. Thank you, Charlene. Happy to be here. Thank All right. You. Well, Tim, I know you're going to be kicking us off. Uh, you have a great presentation, so I'm going to put myself on, on uh, mute and let you get right to your presentation. Great. Thank you. Good morning, like good night, good evening, whatever it might be for you. Uh, appreciate you joining. Uh, today, we're going to be talking about how to secure data in OpenShift environments. We've seen Kubernetes begin to be more rapidly adopted and embraced in the DevOps initiatives. And I think it's at a point now where as we move more into production and further the uses of Kubernetes through enterprise platforms like OpenShift, we're gonna to need to make sure we secure the data that's being used. Real quick, I'm never uh, long to talk about uh, BIOS. I just want folks to know I've been around the business for a while, specifically in the tech industry, whether that be hardware, software, telco, networking, and I've really embraced the software and security aspect of it over the last 10 years. So I feel that between all of those experiences, I really can help to convey where the future of security is going and the technologies that may need to be uh, having data protection around. Maxim? Yes, thank you, Tim. And thanks everybody for joining us today, um, for taking the time out of your day. and. Um, I'm Maxim Jankowski, Vice President of Engineering, Zeraset. Um, I've been working in Silicon Valley for the past roughly around 20 years, um, starting with enterprise databases in different companies, different enterprises. And um, for the past 15 years or so, my primary career focus has been enterprise data security in, and encryption, again, in various enterprises. And um, I've seen uh, the legacy encryption solutions, I've seen the more modern encryption solutions, and we've seen uh, challenges and difficulties with adopting encryption and securing the data in modern environment. And so that's why we're doing what we're doing as Zeta said. We're going to go into more details about that in, the, in that presentation. Thank you. Great. So let's dive right in. Um, I think this is a first one for everybody to get their history lesson. No need to flash back too much into high school, but it does properly represent where the world is going. So for those not aware, that's the Tower of London in the UK. And what you can see here is just look at the, the pictures over the course of five, six, seven, eight, nine hundred 900 years, you've seen that the defenses have continued to have to grow based on the most coveted asset out there for the since the beginning of time for us is treasure, is cash, is gold. These are items that William Conquer realized had to be protected. And this is where the currency and the mint was for almost 500 years. Well, everyone's going to sniff that out, aren't they? And before you know it, people are trying to invade and grab everything. And look at how large it's finally gotten just now in 2020, 2020, $32 billion. Now, some would say that's impenetrable. Uh, because of all the defenses that have grown throughout. But you can see that although there was only one back in the 1600s, just in the last eight years, there have been two. So nothing is perfect. 
there's always some way and somehow to get in, but we're going to talk about one of the best ways to defend the treasure, the data. So as you can tell, data, and we've all seen it just in the last 10, 15 years, how much more data is created, the value of it. Think of all the nation states, uh, bad actors, criminals, folks just wanting to prove a point that they can steal data. They're doing it. And what is being recorded, what is being stored, how we're using that data continues to evolve and benefit society. But as that benefits, the temptation to grab this new treasure just continues to grow along with it. Uh, if you didn't see the correlation, we're at the zettabyte level of data generation and the name of the company is Zettaset. So when I look at all of this data, the real focus and the strategies that are out there are these digital transformations. It, it is kind of a buzzword, but it does best capture how do we utilize all this data that's being generated. And that's a great stat, right, from the, the left side, that that much data, 90% of what's out there has just been created in the last two years. It's astounding. And yes, some of it's important, some of it isn't important, some is sensitive, some may not, but you're going to hear the mantra from us, why not just protect it all? Okay, why be selective when you can just protect it all? And as the storage uh, locations and strategies have evolved, so to have where? Public clouds, clouds, things on the edge, whether it's virtual or not, the options for where to store data continue to evolve. And I think where we are now is how do we optimize tapping that data? How do we get to it quickly? And when we do that, and we put these quicker applications, quicker taps to the data in, that's called the digital transformation initiatives. So what happens? And as you would expect, the quicker you do it, the more you forget about security, the more you are likely to be breached. So on this pursuit for value, the customer experience, uh, bottom line profits, and whatever other benefits data may have for society, if you go too fast, you're gonna be in trouble. So how do we continue this speed and give peace of mind and give protection? And that's what we'll talk about. Here's a great example. I, there'll be a couple of use cases we'll talk about, but this one is probably one of the most uh, important ones to the safety of our country. And I would say that every other country out there has an initiative like this. So where we are now is there's this multi-domain operation of all the five levels, and I'm sure some people didn't even know there were five levels, of military sharing of data. Just look at that picture and realize that's a lot of data, okay? So how does the Air Force deal with the Army, deal with the Navy, deal with what we're seeing in space? And the biggest holdup right now is trust. It's not too, uh, you know, it's not uncommon. It's not, it's probably very obvious, in fact, to most, especially in the military with how sensitive that data is to the security of the country. Um, and uh, General Charles Brown captured it uh, very succinctly. So how do we get over that? We, if we love data sharing to benefit us all, how do we give trust? Well, these are some of the reasons I think we need to get over it. We have trust and then you have the risk of data being stolen. So the two together are a fine balance. If we can do one thing, we control the environments that that data can be operating in, and we'll tell you how we do that. But look at some of the different benefits. You can, with the citizen care and protection, that's healthcare. That's uh, any kind of sharing that may go between um, you know, social services and healthcare and uh, the, the prison system, or how, think about it, if someone is released and they need to compare their healthcare, see where they're living with the housing, and we're just trying to help people. Now, it sounds like it's borderline, and, and the, with a balance of privacy, and that's the other aspect of it. There's all these benefits to our citizens, and yet we have to make sure we balance privacy and compliance. And for us, encryption really is one of the best ways to do it. And if you look at any of the regulations out there from local to state to international, security comes from encryption, and it's one of the better lines of defense for data protection. There's others, and I want to make sure we all understand that. I view things as a three-legged stool. Okay, I want you to remember that in your mind's eye. One leg is identity access and management, role-based access control. That's one and it's obvious we need passwords and everything like that. 
The other one is let's audit, let's man it, monitor and audit and do some runtime analysis and remediation if we see something happen. Okay. The third one, leg of this tool, is encryption. It's protecting the data. Protect that data. And I think the three together are a great combination and your best bet for security. Well, we're here to focus on the encryption leg of it. And I will always say there's other pieces of it, but know that we're focused on that. Okay. That's, and I'm not going to read all the other bullet points of areas that you can see the benefit of all this shared data, but I'm sure each one of you watching can see how you and your individual area can help with this. Um, by the way, the state one, uh, the Fusion Center is a great one just so we have that. That's where the federal and the state and local law enforcement share data to make sure the protection is there for all our citizens. And to do that, they definitely need trust and minimize the risk of a breach and theft. Okay. Um, I'll let Maxim kind of dive in with this, but know that it's, you know, the consensus of the experts out there that protecting data should start with encryption. If you want to talk a little bit quickly about the rest of that, go ahead, Maxim. Right. Yes. Thank you, Tim. Um, yeah, the, the, the way to establish trust is to protect the data, as Tim mentioned. And the best way to protect the data, commonly agreed, is to, to encrypt the data. Now, data protection is never one product, never one technology. It's always a combination of, like, we, you've, like we've shown you on the very first slide, it's a combination of the outer walls, the castle, you know, the bridges, and, and fundamentally the safe where the treasure is stored. Um, but the data protection should really start from within. And that means find where your data is and encrypt it. Start with encrypting it in storage. Uh, but really, after you encrypt it in storage, you have to think about how the data moves, where the data is going to, and make sure that the data is always encrypted and never stays in the clear until the very moment that the data needs to be used to derive intelligence from. So encrypt the data throughout the process. And encryption has been pretty well figured out over the um, past years, uh, but encryption is still using the fundamental concept of an encryption key, data encryption key, the key encryption key, other types of keys. Um, now that you're encrypting the data with those keys, you need to make sure that the keys themselves are protected. And the f encryption 101 says never store a key next to your data because otherwise, you know, why, why bother encrypting in the first place? It's kind of like if you're trying to protect your house, it's not a great idea to put your key under the doormat. So keep the um, data encrypted and keep the keys separate from the data. And the truth of the matter is that bad actors will get into your environment. They'll try to attack it. They'll try to uh, gain unauthorized access. And you want to detect and uh, alert to that early. So all access to and all manipulation to every single data element, they should be logged at all, um, at all times. So make sure that you have the login and alerting mechanism in place. And with these top three methods, um, you'll be pretty well on your way with, uh, to a good data security and protection. So what does that all mean? I think we've made a good point here that, listen, let's protect the data, the actual data with encryption. So if the experts know that, and to a certain extent, everyone else does, they're, they're, that you have to ask yourself, what is the holdup? We've got 92% using sensitive data. And these digital transformations continue to grow. And with that comes data sharing. So if we know this, and a third of the folks out there are using it, what about the other two thirds? That's a large share, and we don't know who is in that two thirds that doesn't use it. It could be sensitive data, it could be regulatory, uh, reg where there needs to be data, where there's, if there's not compliance, there's fines, there's, I would call it profit loss, there's shame that you're being dragged out into the village and punished and the PR that comes with that and the loss of business and eruption. There is a wealth of things that happen if that data gets stolen. And to me, only having one third of the folks out there realize that is a little surprising, but at the same time, we're here to help. So these are what we feel are some of the better uh, paths to a security strategy. Okay. Now, the first and foremost is it's got it's a bad idea to wait. Okay, we know that there's plenty of folks out there who it could be Kubernetes, it could be a container strategy, it could be a DevOps strategy, whereby if you're in the rush to find that optimization, that value to get that app out with your your coders, 
to get it out and then leverage it with any type of customer service, you're going to find out that there's a, there's a wall. You can't go much further without security. And it's at that point where you're going to heat how to go back and put some kind of security system in place. And the value we can add is we can do that without the business interruption that would normally take down a system for months at a time. Uh, personally, we would recommend, and I'm sure every security expert would, do it up front. When you're designing your DevOps and your Kubernetes, and more importantly, you're rolling out OpenShift, ensure you incorporate all facets of security, and us being the encryption um, of the sensitive data. Okay, uh, Maxim, I know you love to talk about the second one and a couple of these. Yeah, it's it's a lot easier to engineer with security in mind, simply because putting security in place after the solution's already been deployed. Uh, not only it's a bad idea, it's, it's also pretty complex. And a lot of compromises come from the fact that we've already deployed a solution, it's already running, we can take our users offline, so how do we do security? And now we're not really thinking about security, we're thinking about how do we put a check on the compliance form saying we are compliant. Unfortunately, a lot of enterprises are basically saying, let's just achieve compliance, and security is a means by which we achieve compliance, but we're not really thinking about the best security. We're thinking about how do we put a check mark on the box, and that doesn't go very well with prote actually protecting customer data and, and um, sensitive information. So the way to do it, and by the way, why is DevOps such a unique opportunity for um, enterprises to put security in place and to improve on their security is because to take full advantage of DevOps environments, think Kubernetes, think OpenShift, to take full advantage of what those environments have to offer, uh, you really have to architect and engineer your application uh, with the understanding that you've got to be splitting it into microservices, you have to be making sure that um, communications are taking place appropriately between different application components. So now that you're doing all this architecture and engineering work, and you're really modernizing your application for this high performance environment, it's a good place to step back and say, whatever concessions I've made consciously or, or uh, subconsciously uh, over the years, not putting security in there, I'm going to take that, take care of that right now because, well, I'm, I'm taking apart my application anyway. So let's make it more secure. Let's make it safer. Um, just like bug fixes are more expensive than development, adding security on top of an existing product is a lot more expensive and a lot more difficult proposition. So what do you do? You go to your stakeholders, you identify what drives your security, and it's usually a combination of you know, compliance, data protection initiatives, and you find a way to balance that. You don't go all the way into making a system so closed and so difficult to use that nobody's going to use it, but you also try to stay somewhere in the middle uh, where the system is secure, the system is compliant, but it's also high performant and usable. And it's important to understand that every environment that you're going to look at, every DevOps environment, especially Kubernetes, containerized environments, they'll give you a what I would call a core set of technologies that would allow you to protect your data. But they, they themselves, the environments themselves, will not protect your data. Uh, Kubernetes will give you secrets and password management and being able to store certificates in a secure storage. Uh, but that does not mean that your data is going to be protected. And you'll have to take extra steps to actually use those technologies um, to protect your data. And our solution is a great way to deploy inside Kubernetes, integrate it natively in it, and it will take care of um, protecting your data, not just providing you the primitives. Okay, thanks, Max. So here we are. We got to this point where we've identified the issues, we've given a solution, we need to get it implemented, we need to have uh, more of the enterprise roll it out. Well, not only us, but Red Hat saw this, especially if you go look at the security port these guys put out, it's great. What's the very top thing? They see that this attack surface has done nothing but increase as there's a hybrid and some migration to the cloud. And one of the benefits of OpenShift is the fact it's a hybrid solution. You no longer are just limited to either a data repository on-prem or a data repository in the cloud. You now have a hybrid solution. And as we expand OpenShift, you'll see that the best and optimal way to tap data will be from both 
But in doing so, there's multitude of more attack surfaces that uh, bad actors are going to find to penetrate. So in that case, we definitely have to look at it from a holistic point of view. You can't just look at, hey, protect the data on-prem versus protecting it in, um, in the cloud. So to have both, you have to have a marriage of the two. We've got a great tool with OpenShift to manage all the data, uh, the containers, but we, we're here to help. We're here to protect it. So what's going on? Why hasn't this happened? We've been preaching for a couple slides now. It's encryption, encryption, encryption for data protection. But these are the reasons that we've found. This has not changed. These six have not changed in three years. So there is this wall, this gate of, and how do we get over it? And we at Zetaset feel that we've got a solution that will help with that. And this will help with further OpenShift deployments and OpenShift deployments that work in production that leverage data sharing to really benefit everyone. The top one, for those of you who don't know much about encryption, the cryptographic uh, computation, it takes a little power. It will impact your performance. Don't let anybody tell you it won't. So you'll get some latency. If you can minimize that, you got yourself a differentiator. And that's what Maxim and our guys at our team have figured out. Figured out a way to minimize that. So it's transparent. You're not even going to know it's there because when you ask for the data, it's going to be there. You're going to have it presented to you. Well, that's great, but we need to make sure we enforce the policy for that person alone and we have the ability to push it out and keep it out there and make sure that the right people are seeing the right data and the wrong will not. Again, I'm, I can read them, but you, you get the point on the hybrid. Uh, being able to scale, this is the important part for us. We're, we're just software. We don't have a hardware, we're indifferent to it. There's no appliance we can scale remotely. So we've got a solution that scales with any kind of environment, just like OpenShift will scale globally. Yeah. We can do it with them. And Tim, if uh, you don't mind, I'll, I'll, I'll jump in there for a second to, to talk <laughs> <laughs> a little bit more about uh, system scalability. It's it's um it, it's it's critical because OpenShift environments and and Kubernetes environments tend to be what I call the unattended environments, right? Where storage provisioning and things like um, creating processes and uh, creating containers and creating pods and, and setting up network channels this all is supposed to happen automatically you simply cannot have an operator go in and do something with the storage um, when a new container needs to spin up and needs to uh, come become a part of the pod and then needs to attach to a persistent volume that just cannot happen um, so we've gone through the same process that we kind of preach to others is that you take your solution you containerize it properly and you make sure it runs natively in uh, kubernetes environments so while doing that we figured out that what are all the um quote-unquote um, manual or human processes that are part of deploying security and encryption and we automated all of them so that you can essentially install our system and it will take care of making sure that all the data is in the secure state and in the encrypted state at all times when in storage and you don't have to involve operators um, meaning human operators you don't have to involve any human interaction everything is done um, automatically so maxim has a great saying and i think all of us should say that this is the mantra everyone should take when it comes to encryption if we can make encryption so easy why wouldn't you just encrypt everything look at the iphone the iphone behind the scenes is completely encrypted some people most people didn't know that until you know the last five years but that's how we feel let's just encrypt everything keep it safe and we'll present the data to you and unspeaking notes to you we've got it protected behind the scenes so we get just real quick i'm not gonna I, i'm not a fan of reading slides but this is the value prop, which is important because this is how we can help OpenShift. And I've already hit on it a little bit. Performance, performance, performance. Our, min, our impact is 3 to 7%. That is massively better than other encryption solutions out there that could be anywhere from 25 to 60. Okay. Happy to get in more into that in a technical conversation, but no, that really is a differentiator for us. And of course, if you really wanted to, you could just selectively encrypt things, but we say, we'll give you the option, but just encrypt everything. 
Um, when it comes to the ease of use, I'm sure most people aren't cryptographic experts. I'm sure there'll be a lot of users out there that aren't in the security team. They may be in the DevOps group and just be uh, forced and handed, hey, can you secure these environments? Others could be in IT and they just need to figure it out themselves as well. So if we can make it easy for you and we can get it so it's point and encrypt and it's transparent to everybody behind the scenes, I think we've made a differentiator that should make it easy enough for, again, everyone to utilize encryption and deploy it everywhere. Uh, and by everywhere, being uh, software only, it can scale anywhere. Uh, we can have it run across uh, all environments, whether it's the edge, virtual, physical, or obviously in cloud. So when you're software, you kind of got that benefit. And with it, we'll protect your data at rest and in motion. And you can imagine with OpenShift, as it gets more adopted, you're going to have data flying everywhere, and we're going to go with it. I like to say, if you're managing the data, uh, you need to secure the data. And as new technologies come, you got to keep pace with them and securing them. The other one would be, if you need the data as you spin it up, we're going to give you the security around it as you spin it up and down. Okay. Uh, Maxim, do you have anything you want to add um, in addition? Otherwise, we can keep rolling. Yeah, I think... Performance really over the years, like I said, we've been doing security for a number of years now and encryption as well. Uh, performance has been at the forefront of what we hear from customers when we ask them, you know, what's your impediment in deploying um, a security solution? They always say, well, it's going to slow down my processes and I cannot really take another minute to to make this computation or to present this web screen to to um, to my users. So performance, 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 and and also, uh, do I need to hire a dedicated uh, security and encryption expert to deploy a solution? That's obviously well, oftentimes a non-starter. But and I think Tim talked about that as well. Is that a lot of enterprises have already investment in existing security uh, infrastructure? They already bought key managers. Uh, you need to be able to interoperate with them. Uh, and that means that the security solution should be built around standards. And that's where cryptographic expertise comes into mind. So we engineered all of that in our solution, so you just have to deploy it. That's really that's really the big benefit there. All right, well, let's take it back up to a high level on something which you might think is not the high level when you see this, but you, you might say, all right, Tim Maxim, I get it, I get it, I need to encrypt. And maybe some of you know some basic encryption, you know some different options you don't necessarily have to read uh, or have us walk through it. I want you to think of this in your mind's eye. If sand is data, okay? If sand is the data, how do you protect it? Well, you know, you have your self-encrypting drives on one side. You know what that is? That's just securing the beach. Overall, one key and you get in. And then the other end of it is, let's secure every grain of sand with a key. Uh, you know, then you're into the Goldilocks. Well, too much, too little, performance impact. What's the middle ground? Well, how about you just encrypt the bucket of sand? It's, it's good enough that you have protection on select data groups, and it still gives you the speed and performance. That middle ground is the best way to marry yourself to Kubernetes and to OpenShift, because you'll take away the benefits of OpenShift and Kubernetes by shackling it with too much uh, detail, too much granularity when it comes to encryption. You need performance and flexibility, and we fit that middle ground. Think of it, it's Goldilocks. That's how we view it. So this is where we feel that together, and I've been kind of saying it the whole time, with the hybrid environments and this agility that OpenShift brings, we can continue to protect it because we're software only and we scale, and we can do it behind the scenes so that it's secure and it doesn't really impact Red Hat uh, OpenShift users. And in doing that, again, we're one of the legs of the stool. We understand that. And as far as our leg of the stool, we're gonna help you go to that DevSecOps mantra, okay? And I think that is where we need to go if we want to see production environments and we wanna see more data sharing. Um, and one thing I wanna add there on the previous slide, or this one is as good as any, actually, is, is that, uh, Tim just briefly mentioned that uh, developers, um, the idea of the, the DevOps environment is to empower developers and give them um, 
a quick development environment, quick way to develop software and push it from development to stage into production. And in that rapid accelerated agile development, what we want to make sure is that the developers don't have to make determinations and judgments whether or not the data is sensitive enough to be secured and encrypted. Uh, they need to focus on development. You don't want a developer sitting there in front of the console and saying, hey, does, does that look like a social security number? Does it look like an ACH number that I need to encrypt? You want the developer to focus on develop, developing solutions and pushing them out quickly and with high quality. You don't want developers to assessing um, to be assessing the security level or sensitivity level of your data. Okay. So really quick, we don't have to get into this. This is a visual for you. This is simply telling you, and a lot of you may have heard of containers and Kubernetes and OpenShift, but how does it all fit together? It's just a, it's a cake. You, we can encrypt at the container level, and that's obviously Docker is one of them. And then when Docker has 200, 2,000 containers, you're going to need Kubernetes to orchestrate it. And we can do it at that level. And then hardening that with the enterprise and orchestration that OpenShift brings ties it all together in a nice little bow. So that's your step back. If you can talk about it when you're out and about, but that's how it all works together. And this goes back to the Tower of London, okay? If you just watched, the orange guy leaped over the walls. So he made it past the moat, the drawbridge, the guards, the guard tower, everything. And he got inside, he got to the treasure. So how do we help? What do we do there? We make it so each one of those houses of treasure is locked, closed, and encrypted. And there you have it. You've now become that last line of defense, which is critical, and you've avoided the encryption, the, the theft that would happen. Someone can steal encrypted data all they want, but they're never going to see it. It's the great part of the cryptog cryptography. Um, I'll let Max talk in this for a second, but you know how I just gave you a cake slide of how it builds? Here's what it looks like within an OpenShift system. Yeah, and and to to make it transparent and to make it high performant, um, and to make it well engineer and developer friendly and in general human friendly, we had to do some interesting things. Uh, one thing, and again, we preach a lot about this. We we talk a lot about the fact that if you want a high performance solution running in modern Kubernetes environment, it has to run natively in that environment. You can just take a legacy. Um, solution, especially a legacy encryption solution, and say, you know what, I'm just going to deploy it as part of my infrastructure, and now I'm done. Suddenly, I'm using my server encryption solution that I've been using for the past 20, 30 years, and look, it performs just as well in my new infrastructure. The truth is, it may perform well, but it has no awareness of Kubernetes, it has no awareness of containers, all it's doing is encrypting the good old hard drives. That is not the approach that you want to take, because as this awareness is missing, um, you will not be able to protect your data with the granularity that comes with multi-tenant environment and Kubernetes environments. So think about one of the big reasons why Kubernetes was built is, is to allow massively parallel and highly multi-tenant environments. So solution providers can essentially deploy a set of uh, large Kubernetes clusters and can host the data concurrently. And um, you can have, within one large Kubernetes cluster. You can have a data for a healthcare provider, uh, let's say Blue Cross and Blue Shield, you can have a data for another healthcare provider. And um, all of those healthcare providers will be sharing not only the compute, but also the data layer. So um, the question whether or not a system will be attacked is not really a question, it's more of a certainty. The systems will be attacked. And uh, do you want one compromised container? In a multi-tenant environment to expose your entire data environment, I think it's it's pretty much a no-brainer answer. No, you don't. Um, if one container is compromised, but your encryption is on the infrastructure layer, uh, then you're essentially sharing um, data layer keys with um, all the um, all the containers and all the applications. And if that happens, one compromised container compromised the entire environment. So what we've done, we've developed a solution that runs natively in Kubernetes. It has all the components of a good security solution. It has the certificate authority that allows all the components and all the solutions to talk securely with one another. It has the key manager, just in the spirit of being self-contained. We're not asking you to go to Talos and buy their key manager. We provide a software-based key manager that you can run so that you would maintain ownership of your keys. 
back to earlier in the presentation, we talked about not keeping the keys next to the data. And our key manager container does just that. It allows you to keep the keys separate and secure. And host manager is an interesting container because what it allows you to do is to run um, database containers, web application containers, pretty much any containers. And it allows those containers to take advantage of the data security and encryption that we provide without having to insert any of the software in those application containers. And so CSI adapter is essentially the one that takes care of tying it all with the boat in integration uh, integration in the OpenShift environment. So it's a, a full breadth of product that can be containerized and it's ready to go. It's on marketplace right now for uh, OpenShift. So let me pull it all together for you because some people have heard, oh wait, there's all these other security tools. We absolutely agree and we partner with them. If you look on the top right, it says it all. If you're look, working with Kubernetes and you're working with containers and pods of containers, all those tools, all those companies, which are essential, and they're the other legs of the stool, like I said, they're all up there. They're not focusing on protecting the data, which is great. We can partner with you and we can give you the full security solution. So some might say, well, we've got the legacy solutions and that takes care of everything. And that go back to my beach, okay? Those volume, those storage volume, different, uh, op the different environments, the different types, what the vendors have, whether it's volume or even Ceph or EVS, one key gets you into that white piece, okay? One key, you get that key, you get to see all the data. What we did is we kind of took that next level up. Well, if you pull data into these things called persistent volumes, just think of them as the bucket, we can encrypt each one individually, so we really do mitigate that chance of getting access to all the data. And you can do that across a, an infinite amount of pods and containers. So it scales as OpenShift scales. And without that, there's a missing piece. So you can look at it and go, well, should I go bottoms up with my encryption? Or should I leverage this new technology and put a new way of doing security in this new technology and go tops down like we have. And we're finding that that is a more appealing because again, gives you the feature and the functionality you want and the peace of mind that comes with leveraging uh, Kubernetes and containers in an agile way. And I am certain Maxim has something to say about all this. Absolutely, absolutely, yes. And it's interesting that a lot of, uh, with DevOps and DevSecOps um, and Kubernetes and OpenShift environments, there's always um, a pretty interesting, pretty lengthy conversation about the fact that you need to protect container images, you need to make sure that you have runtime scanners running inside your containers to protect the runtime environment, you need to secure your uh, Kubernetes ports, um, the control plane needs to be run with proper security and proper authorizations. There will be, it's going to be a role-based access control. I can go for the next five minutes, listing out all this important stuff that obviously needed to be taken care of. But I think in all this lengthy list, we're forgetting one thing, which is essentially what it's all about, is securing the data. Yes, it's great that our Kubernetes cluster is the most secure in the world. It's great that we are running trusted stacks and containers. Well, if our data is sitting in the clear or it's sitting in the legacy encryption environment that's not even really aware of Kubernetes, then we put this great perimeter around it. But once somebody is inside, we're essentially done. Our business is essentially done. So the idea here is it's very important to protect your containerized environment, but all of it is done in the name of protecting your data. So you should really start thinking about protecting your data first and then putting the perimeter security on top of that. And that's where we come in. That's where we say legacy encryption is not going to protect your data. It's going to give you an illusion of protection. And when um, you do need to protect your data, you need to think granular. You need to think about how do you deploy an encryption solution that will make sure that every persistent volume is encrypted with a unique key. So like I said, in the multi-tenant environment, one compromised container will not bring down your entire environment and your entire enterprise. So how does this all come together for data sharing, which is the point of this? Well, let, think about Kubernetes well, and DevOps. It, it initially, how it's being adopted right now is how quickly you can get out new apps and new apps that meet the customer needs and new technologies that you're designing. That's great, but that's just the beginning of how you can use 
Kubernetes and containers, just the very front. I think the end game is to leverage all this flexibility and technology that comes with Kubernetes to put it into action and somehow quarterback data, movement of data, everything that comes with tapping that data with applications, the applications that'll benefit us all. That's the, that's the end game, is sharing the data, leveraging OpenShift to do that. And what we'll see is the value across, back to what I said at the beginning, it could be protecting the country. It could be linking all the data from a health to well-being of a citizen but while still meeting privacy needs. It could help smart cities. Um, there could be AI and decision making that comes out of it. And all of this is going to be ver it's going to be very agile and performance based to get real time answers. And if you're going to do real time answers, you got to do real time protection. And that's how we see the world of data sharing in the OpenShift and Kubernetes environments. Now, you can put insert entity on each one of these. The left side could be, if I use just Air Force and Navy, if I use uh, the likes of a healthcare provider and uh, some kind of social service, whether I use a police department with state and fed, like a fusion center, doesn't matter. You can see the left needs to share with the right. So how do they do that with, let's bring it all back again, trust and minimize that risk of data theft. And this is how you do it. And from the moment someone needs the data on the left side from a database, they're able to make the request. It spins it up into a little bowl. That's what I want you to think of, or a bucket of sand. We gotta encrypt that and protect that bucket of sand as it travels over and gets shared with the other side. And then we're able to limit who gets to see it? If one, you get one key to see just the bucket. And we're able to keep that time-wise, maybe that person over in the data share in that container on the right only needs to see it for a month. So we can make that key expire. We find out there's a bad actor in this organization, in the police department or in a healthcare provider, wherever, you can immediately delete the key or inactivate it. So you secure the data from any future theft. So it's a to be optimal, to help with all these values that come with data sharing, this is the best way to protect that data. Maxim, you helped design this. I'm sure you got more to say. Yes, yeah, certainly. It, it kind of brings us back to a set of earlier slides that we, where we talked about trust um, uh, being the currency and um, sharing, obviously, with the amount of data that we have and the amount of services that we have uh, that can benefit from, from having access to this data. Uh, data sharing is a must. The um, Neither enterprises, nor services, nor governments can operate in silos. They need to, to be able to access the, uh, each other's data. But also, like Tim said, there's there's um, the trust should be based on security, not on you know the word of mouth, not on the node. Um, so when you give somebody your data, Typically, you think of it when you when you give somebody your your possession. You typically think of it as relinquishing control of that possession, at least temporarily. And if that somebody is a physically remote entity, then the only the only way for you to reclaim that possession is to kind of travel and then try to take it over. Um, that may or may not be possible, especially when you're talking about gigabytes and terabytes of data. You don't know where it's gone. What you do want to know is that when you give somebody your data, that you maintain control, not only of your own data, but the data that you've given away. The model of sharing that we're discussing here and we're proposing is, is that um, not only the data is protected in transit to the receiving party, but also I am as a data owner, I have the final say for how long my data is shared. And when I decide that this sharing is no longer warranted, I can essentially push a button what it means in our solution literally run a script and that script will make sure that the person i shared the data with no longer has access to the data i don't need to reach out to that person and say hey please turn off the server i don't need to reach out to that person and say hey please delete my data i run a script in my environment and then that other person will no longer have access to their copy of my data so that ability to remotely manage the data you shared is super critical super important in establishing trust and safety in in um in sensitive sharing environments
I think that's that's pretty much. I mean, it it sounds complex, and it is in the implementation, but we've made it simple and easy um, on the user level or on the administrator level. And there's really, like Tim said earlier, there's really no excuse for not deploying that encryption and that security because it's simple to deploy and it's going to give you not just a peace of mind, but it's going to give you uh, protections uh, from any type of attacks you know, having to do with data addressed. Mm -hmm. So I hope that gives you a good idea and it got the wheels turning within each of your sectors within your own organizations. There's plenty of benefits to it. And at the, at the end of it all, there is a focus that needs to be on marrying security with the benefits of Kubernetes and OpenShift. And we're there to do it for you. I think that if you continue down the path of seeing what Kubernetes can be used for, like I said before, the end game is sharing data to add value to citizens, protect us, the bottom line, help with decisions more real time. There's a wealth of it, but you need to be as flexible with your security offering as you are with the abilities that Kubernetes brings to the table. Uh, in that case, if you if you can do it and manage people's confidentiality that comes with all the sensitive data, I think you're well on your way. It minimizes the amount of uh, breaches that you may have. Again, it's three legs of the stool, but we're just talking about the encryption one here. Specific to the developers, to go back to that, not even dealing with the data sharing, you no longer have to have them be in charge of security. And there are quite a few. I think one of the surveys said like 50% of DevOps folks are still being forced to deal with the security. That shouldn't be a case. So if at a minimum, we can take a, that burden off of them. And by doing that, we can either retroactively get that encryption place for your environment as it stands now, or we can do it right from the beginning. And we hope as you see the benefits of OpenShift, you think of Zetaset to encrypt the data in those. And even if you've already deployed OpenShift, maybe you want to go further. Maybe you want to go further into data sharing like we just talked about today. In that case, we're here to help that and take that concern and get you compliant and have the benefits pre-put into play and find that value across any type of sector. You can do that with encrypting your sensitive data. I, I hope everyone can see this out of this. We'd love to have you check out the product. You can see we're on Red Hat Marketplace as it stands. There's the link at the bottom. Uh, appreciate the time and uh, thank you very much, Charlene. Uh, that's going to do it for us. Um, All right. Great. So we have plenty of time for question and answer period. Um, if you have a question, please go ahead and use your GoToWebinar control panel. We have gotten some in so far, um, some good ones actually. So why don't we go ahead and dive right on in. Uh, here is our first one. What kind of security is needed for AI ML value extraction? I'll take that one. Um, so the, the amount of data, right? The amount of data that's collected for artificial intelligence and you know, you think artificial intelligence and machine learning Essentially, you start by populating it with huge amount of data, some relevant, some not, um, and um, ultimately the uh, the algorithm is beginning to learn, is beginning to sift through this this sets of data and and try to be better at you know giving you answers. Um, what we're talking about here is large data sets. Large data sets obviously need to be secured and encrypted efficiently. You cannot introduce 20 to 30 percent performance penalty so what you're looking at is an encryption that runs literally inside your um most likely inside the kernel stack of the worker nodes if we're talking kubernetes specifically um, what you're talking about is an encryption that introduces as little performance as possible but also does not change the way that you are um, operating your processes so performance and transparency is is um, if you're looking at, at an encryption solution uh, you need to look from the perspective of performance. You need to look from the perspective of transparency. And um, some, some will say that encryption data for artificial intelligence, this, this data is not really or not often classified as sensitive. But again, the idea is not to have to think about whether the data is sensitive or not. We had to do this classification of more or less sensitive data when encryption was so slow and so low performance that was well well over 30 years ago um 
or even 20 years ago, that's when encryption would take such a toll on the execution environment. Right now, encrypt everything and focus on deriving um, business intelligence from your data and don't think about which data needs to be encrypted or not. So high performance encryption and transparent, transparent encryption is the type of encryption you need for artificial intelligence. All right, <clears throat> excuse me. All right, next question. How does licensing scale as you scale up and down containers infrastructure? That's actually an excellent question. Uh, the, the, the licensing scales very simply. Our licenses is based on um, course, uh, virtual course, and their uh, licensing is attached to uh, worker nodes. So it's very simple to say I have a Kubernetes cluster with 50 worker nodes. Every worker node has 24 cores, and that's going to be a licensing model. All right, great. Uh, next question here. In, phys in physical, is it a conventional file system or S3 object storage? And what is the performance difference between them with Zetaset? So with Zetaset, on, um, specifically on the uh, Kubernetes environments, we are actually encrypting storage that is um, attached to the worker nodes, whether or not it's a dedicated storage attached, attached to the worker nodes or if it's a shared storage. Um, we are encrypting that storage as what we call raw devices. So by the time it's presented to containers, it's already transparently encrypted and containers just simply operate with it as, as the, they would if the storage was not encrypted. So it doesn't really make a difference. Um, by the virtue of us integrating natively into Kubernetes storage layer, uh, you've probably noticed the container storage interface drivers that we've developed um, when we talked about the solution architecture. Uh, that type of integration basically means that whatever storage system you're deploying, we can work on top of that. Uh, since I heard um, S3 and I heard uh, classic client server environments, we also do have solutions for those types of environments. Uh, but as we talked previously, those are different solutions because we do believe that um, client server environments are separate set of solutions, S3 environments are separate sets of solutions, and Kubernetes and containers require separate solutions. So we have all of those, but here today we were focusing mostly on Kubernetes and OpenShift. Okay. All right. Great. We have about four minutes to uh, the time when we need to close out the question and answer period. So uh, I think we have time for one more question here. And this is an easy one for you. Does your product have a feature rich, publicly accessible API? Um, so when you think about publicly accessible APIs, you typically think about administering the product or um, taking advantage of the product feature via um, APIs. And uh, our product is essentially a set of containers managed by an operator, uh, the operator being the, um, um, the native Kubernetes operator as a construct, not as a person. Um, that being said, we have a, a very simple set of um, scripts. You could call them APIs, but they're essentially scripts to perform common maintenance tasks. Uh, we have no really need for for a um, user level interaction. Um, you don't need to send our system messages to encrypt storage volumes. This is all done automatically. Uh, administrators need to interact with our products um, at certain times where, let's say, administrator suspects that a cluster node has been compromised. They, they're going to need to send a special message to our system to say, hey, I would like you to securely decommission that cluster node so it can no longer have access to encrypted data. And that's done by simply executing the script. Uh, so uh, if you're thinking programmatic um, REST APIs, we don't have them because there's no need for them. Uh, when you're thinking about um, automating common administrative tasks, we have scripts for that. Uh, a little bit of a preview is that in the next, uh, or actually in the first quarter of 2021, we'll be coming out with what we call the Centralized Management Console, uh, which is a product that will pretty much tie, uh, tie in all the encryption technologies that we have um, and will interact with a variety of key managers, ours and uh, other vendors to provide you a unified view of security and encryption in your environment and 
perform uh, common administrative tasks like managing certificates and revoking nodes and decommissioning keys and just giving you a centralized view and a single pane of glass for secu security and encryption management. This one will have a pretty flexible and pretty rich um, REST and JSON based API that you can use to manage your um, clusters with respect to security. All right, great. Well, we are about five minutes to the top of the hour. So unfortunately, that is all the time that we have for the question and answer period. I believe that uh, we got to everybody's questions, but if we didn't for whatever reason, or if uh, you have a quick uh, end of webinar question that you have for either of our speakers, you can still uh, put it in the GoToWebinar control panel and any question that wasn't answered during question and answer period uh, will be, uh, they'll be getting the folks at Zetas that will be getting a copy of all the questions. So I'm sure they'll be more than happy to follow up with you offline to get your question answered. Also, a quick reminder to the audience that today's event has been recorded. So if you missed any or all of the event, or if you just want to watch it again, you'll have the opportunity to do so. Following today's webinar, we will be sending out an email that contains a link to access the webinar on demand. And the webinar is also going to be living on the DevOps.com website. So you can always go look for it there. Just go to DevOps.com slash webinars, look in the on demand section, and it should be right there waiting for you. Okay, now the moment that I'm sure a lot of you have been waiting for, which is the drawing for the four $100 Amazon gift card. So without further ado, we'll go ahead and do that. <clears throat> Excuse me, our first winner today is uh, Shireen G. Congratulations, Shireen. Our second winner today is Sean F. Congratulations, Sean. Third winner today is David C. Congratulations, David. And our final winner today is Elisa N. Congratulations, Elisa. We'll be following up with all four of you offline via email to get your Amazon gift card over to you. So please check your inbox. And if it's not in your inbox, please check your spam folder. All right, uh, Tim and Maxim, thank you very much for a great presentation. Lots of great information. Uh, judging from the questions that came in, I know the audience got a lot out of it. So appreciate your time and your expertise. Great. Thank you thank very you. much. Great, great. Thank you. Also want to thank the audience for joining me today. This is Charlene O'Hanlon, and I'm signing off. Have a great weekend, everybody, and please stay safe.